Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Kim Scott, co-founder of Radical Candor and Just Worth. And I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor Podcast. On our last episode, we talked about how to persuade others that the decision you've made is the right decision. Once everyone's on board, it's now time for action. And this brings us to step six of the get shit done wheel, which we've been covering in previous podcasts. So feel free to get up to speed. But if you're ready to get stuff done, this is our moment. Now, another thing I want to remind you all is that we made a commitment to stop using unnecessarily violent language. And we asked for your feedback to rename this step. We previously called it execute. Kim, do you want to share anything more about that on the violent language piece? This came from some feedback that Trier gave. She was at a dinner and she wrote a piece about this where at the dinner, business people were using sort of military metaphors, the war room. And she said, as a veteran, it was really upsetting to hear this kind of language being used sort of in a way sort of to glorify violence. And I've gotten other feedback. Someone else on Twitter actually said that the language that I tend to use tends to be violent. I'm not very good at using nonviolent language. And I really thought a lot about this, and I'm trying to do better, to use more precise metaphors. So when we say execute, we're not talking about, obviously, beheading people. (laughs) We're talking about implementing. We're talking about doing the actual work. And so we felt like implement would be a better word than execute. Yeah, I really appreciate that story. To be clear, Trier is Trier Bryant, your co-founder of Just Work, who does have a military background and can speak from personal experience on that. So we are really grateful to our listeners who shared with us your recommendations to replace the word execute. And as Kim said, the word implement came out as the resounding winner. And so today we're going to be talking about the good, the bad, the ugly, when it comes to implementing the decision you've just persuaded everyone to get behind. And Kim, one of the things you write a lot about, you talk a lot about is that as a boss, it's part of your job to take on the quote collaboration tax yourself. And the goal is so that your team can spend more time implementing. I thought it would be helpful for us to spend a few moments actually getting clear on what we mean by the word implementing. And so Kim on page 107, this is in the second edition of the book, You write often, and at that time you wrote execution, but we'll say often implementation is a solitary task. So what are the kinds of tasks that you're talking about here, the solitary tasks versus maybe the collaborative tasks that you're saying, collaborative tasks that might cause a collaboration tax on folks? Yeah. So let me first back up for a minute. When I talked about the collaboration tax, often as a manager, you do take on a lot of the collaboration tax, but also part of your job is to make sure that everyone, that it's being equitably distributed, the collaboration tax, because everyone, obviously in a group, if they're going to collaborate, everybody has to contribute to the collaboration tax. One person can't pay at all. But anyway, what I meant, I'll give you sort of a very specific example, because I think in analogies rather than definitions. But when I was at Google and I was managing the AdSense online sales and operations team, a lot of the work that we did was, for example, answering questions from AdSense customers. And so answering those emails was a solitary task. It wasn't something that we did collaboratively. And we needed to make sure that everyone had enough time to answer those emails, to answer people's questions, and also enough time to figure out how to either make product changes so that those questions and problems wouldn't arise in the first place, or how to automate the answering of those questions. And so that was kind of the work. We called that the core job. (laughs) And it was really important to me that I do that work myself, that I sort of keep the dirt under my fingernails, that I spend a certain amount of time 
every week answering questions, not just meeting with people and telling other people how to answer the questions, but actually doing the work. Because if I didn't do the work myself, then I wouldn't be able to understand the relevance of the ideas that people were having and to understand really why the problems that people were bringing up mattered. So it was also really important. It's tempting when you're a manager to sort of feel like everyone should be doing what you were doing. A big chunk of my time, a big part of my core job was having one-on-ones, sort of offering radical candor, soliciting radical candor, thinking about those things, not about sort of the structure of how we were going to operate as a team. But it was really important for me to remember that that was not other people's core job, that their core Mm -hmm. job was to answer the emails. So that's what I mean. I needed to make sure that I wasn't expecting everyone to be in meetings with me all the time because then they couldn't do their core job. So one example of that was we used to have a team meeting, an all-hands meeting once a week. And as we matured, people thought, do we really need to have this meeting once a week or could we have it once a month instead? And at first, this was sort of like, oh, we have to meet once a week. That was my perspective. Uh, And then I realized that the team, if the team wasn't getting as much out of that meeting, that I needed to be willing to have it less often and to figure out more efficient ways to communicate with them. So that's an example of sort of not wasting my team's time. Mm -hmm. I loved the all-hands meeting. As I'm talking, I'm having this thought about how this might apply to being back in the office. I think a lot of leaders want everybody to be back in the office because so much of their work is collaborative and it's easier for them to do their job Mm -hmm. if everybody's in the same place. But it may not be easier for the (laughs) thousands of people who work for you if you're the CEO to all be in the same place. And you need to really optimize for your team's time, not for your own convenience. I love you bringing that into the push for everyone to be together and the difference in role perhaps between the manager and the individual contributor. Jason, as you hear Kim share about her example in terms of the responding to emails, the more solitary tasks, I'm curious when you look on your experience, did you have examples where folks that worked for you In fact, the majority of their work was more collaborative versus sort of the solitary reply of emails. I'm curious what you think of that balance between solitary and collaborative work and if that can be extrapolated across the board. I would say that one of the most collaborative types of work is product management and design, like product design. Like those two types of work are highly collaborative and not just with team members, but also with clients or customers and other internal stakeholders. And so... When I heard Kim say, you want to make sure that the collaboration tax is sort of equitably distributed, I thought a lot about that. And one of the things that we tried very hard to do when I was leading product at Khan Academy was actually give people, treat it as an opportunity. Managing the collaboration tax was, was also an opportunity for growth because as you grow in your career, for people who are interested in management or leadership roles, dealing with that collaboration tax is actually a valuable skill to learn. And so we created an opportunity to say, like, this is a responsibility. So communicating the progress that a team is making towards a collaborative goal, that was a responsibility that could be shifted from person to person, didn't always fall on the product manager to make those updates. And people were raising their hand to participate in that because they're like, well, I want to get a taste of what that's actually like to be responsible for a period of time of communicating these things. So I think that idea is really important because it does weigh you down. And there is real work that a product manager might have to do. For example, they might have to organize and run a series of customer interviews. That might be part of the work that they have to do. And if they're spending all their time on the collaboration tax, they actually don't have time for the task work that's in front of them. That's what immediately came to mind. I don't know if you can extrapolate that broadly, but I do think you can extrapolate the understanding that someone is paying a collaboration tax when you're doing collaborative work. And if you're not sure who that is, that almost certainly means that it is not being equitably distributed. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, to sort of push a little bit more on this, on the analogy of product management. So a lot of the people, all of the people who are answering the emails 
would be experiencing through the lens of the customer whose question they were answering, the pain that customers were having. Occasionally, there were customers who were writing to tell us how much they loved the product, but usually it was not praise that we were getting. (laughs) And so one of the things that I found was that the people on the team who were the most persuasive, who were the most verbose, tended to go to the product team or just go straight to the engineers and get that particular problem fixed. And the issue there was that that particular problem was not necessarily the most important problem. It was like just happened to be the problem that the most verbal person on the team experienced that day. And so one of the things that we tried to do to, and pretty soon the engineers and the product people didn't want to talk to us anymore because they were getting, we were confusing them by not prioritizing the issues, but by bombarding them with what it was tyranny of the most verbose. And so we try to make sure that we were doing a better job prioritizing amongst ourselves the the issues that we were seeing rather than sort of having this kind of one-off inefficient communication. And it was frustrating for people because it was sort of, it gave people a sense of power or whatever agency to be able to say, oh, there's this problem. I can go get it fixed. Hurrah. I really, it felt productive, but it actually could be counterproductive over time. So that was also part of making sure that we were honoring the time that the product team and the engineering team spent addressing problems by doing a little bit better job prioritizing them. And as you say that, it makes me think about I think a lot of people think engineering is a largely solitary task, is a non-collaborative task. So like software development, people have this image of a person sitting in front of a computer and typing into it, and that seems quite solitary. When you peel back, when you open the, the curtain, though, like it's not because in most companies that have a professional software development process, there's something called code review. So at a minimum, you're working with at least one other person who's like looking at your code and giving you feedback, direct feedback on how well that code is going to work with the rest of the code that might sit around it. My counterpart in engineering and I developed this thing that we called the big board. And the big board was a way for people to asynchronously update other interested parties about what they were learning on their sort of more solitary tasks, the progress they were making towards some shared objective. And we had this really interesting debate because we started out, we had a weekly standing sort of status update type of meeting. And the purpose of that was not literally to say what you had done, but to raise awareness of things that other people might want to know about what you were doing. And engendered this like very heated debate because there were some people who found that irreplaceably valuable like there were things that they found out in that meeting and not not just managers, but the other individual contributors found that irreplaceably valuable. And other people were like, I'd be fine just like reading through the big board and seeing like what people's updates are. And I don't need that sort of synchronous time as a, you know, either a filtering mechanism or a way to elevate a particular message or something like that. And I don't think we ever came up with a super satisfying answer to this. But what I did learn was that there was another value, which was not explicitly about the collaboration itself. There was a social value of people being able to talk about their work. I do think that the collaboration tax, sometimes there are other things that may be worth valuing or prioritizing, even though Mm -hmm. they may not be perfectly efficient. And so I think that's why the guidance that you offer, like these different ways to make sure that you don't trip over yourself like trip over your existing processes and make your team very inefficient. If you can do at least those things, then you create some space, I think, to consider the fact that maybe some of these things have additional value. And even though they're not perfectly efficient, they may still be worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the reason that we're willing to pay pay a collaboration tax is that there's a collaboration dividend. And you want to make sure that... (laughs) You're investing something in the collaboration, but more importantly, you want to focus not on the cost, but on the benefit of collaboration. Yep. And I think that the one of the enormous benefit. I'm just back from vacation, and we spent a lot of time while we were on vacation either sitting around in a circle on the beach talking or sitting on the porch, like staring out at the ocean and rocking chairs talking. 
And there's a lot of benefit in that. I mean, it doesn't feel like we were doing anything incredibly productive. But on the other hand, that is, to me, like at a very basic human level, that's how we build relationships is sitting around a circle talking or mm-hmm. sitting, you know, sitting on the front porch, rocking in chairs, looking out and talking. Well, it's a good segue into the importance of some of what we've already talked about as a boss, building those one-on-one relationships and taking the time to get to know people so that when you do come to more sticky situations, you understand what matters to them. So Kim, if I hear you, just the benefit of having some seemingly non-productive time can actually pay some of the dividends of the collaboration tax as well. Yeah. But I mean, if I was told I had to go to work and sit in a rocking chair, <laughs> I would be pretty yeah. unhappy. So you need to make sure that exactly. The right it's moments. kind of like how Jason lost his taste for coffee after only getting criticism every time he went for a cup of coffee with his yes. exactly. boss. So just to get back into the framework that you have for implementing, you write Kim in Radical Candor that one of the hardest things about being a boss is balancing the responsibilities as a boss with the work that you need to do personally in your area of expertise. You outlined four things you've learned about how to get this balance right. One was don't waste your team's time. Two is keep the dirt under your fingernails. And we've already spoken a little bit about this, but the third was to block time to implement. And the fourth was to fight meeting proliferation. We're going to talk about these four steps, starting with not wasting your team's time, noting that not everyone wants to be on rocking chairs. So a recent (laughs) article from McKinsey noted that most executives say they frequently find themselves spending way too much time on pointless interactions that drain their energy and produce information overload. And low value interaction is defined as real time virtual interaction technology. We're talking things like Zoom and Slack and Teams, group texting, WeChat, WhatsApp, et cetera. Valuable tools, but also eat into time that could be used for what's described as important, creative, and powerful activities. Again, this is from the McKinsey article. We'll put that in the show notes. There was also a study from the University of California, Irvine, finding it takes an average of 23 minutes for people to get back on task after an interruption, like a a ping from Slack. So Jason, Building on our conversation about the need for collaboration, the solitary work that actually may be more collaborative than we might think, how do managers balance the real value of some of these technologically-based collaboration tools with the need for solitary work? I want to say something quickly about the McKinsey article, which is our excerpt does reasonable justice to what was actually included in the article, which I feel like is quite incomplete (laughs) in terms of like making a a super valuable statement about the nature of collaborative work. And the reason why I think it's incomplete is there's this elevation of important, creative, powerful activities and the sort of diminishment of these sort of social interactions that is implied. And I don't know because I didn't, the article didn't present in depth, like how they were distinguishing between those activities. But as we were just saying, there's there's value to both of these things. And really what we're trying to do is find a balance between them. As a, and so as opposed to thinking of it as your goal is to minimize social interaction and maximize alone work, your goal is to find the right balance between social collaborative work and solitary work so that you get the most, the highest collaboration dividend <laughs> that you can. I do find that the study from the University of California is something that I have heard uh, and observed, especially in work that is highly complex and sort of nonlinear, meaning that let's say you, let's use the email example. Let's say 80% of emails can be answered with a stock response because you've heard them so many times interrupting that work, it does not take 23 minutes to get back on task, right? (laughs) Right. The next one is just like a pattern matching exercise to figure out what the best response is. But that other 20% of emails that are like some complicated scenario that require you to do some research or dig into the person's account, and then like compare that, talk to someone in engineering, you know what I'm saying? That type of work, that's what takes 23 minutes to get back on task when it gets interrupted, because you have to unload all of the context of that complex activity 
to deal with the interruption and then reload the context to make sure that you can actually get back on track. Now, obviously, the longer the interruption, the more severe the interruption, the harder it is to sort of regather that context. But I think it's important to recognize what we're talking about. And we're going to talk about blocking time for implementation. But I think one of the toughest things to do is actually for teams to communicate how they are using their time and to create some boundaries for when certain interruptions are allowable versus not. And maybe even more importantly for ourselves to build the self-awareness to know when do I need to protect myself from interruption and how am I going to do that? Because I don't think there's any perfect system. So like, for example, on our sales and operations team, one of the things that we do when someone new joins is we set some expectations about, hey, like how quickly are we expecting a response? So if I send you an email, when do I expect a response from you? Well, how about if I Slack you or how about if I text or call you? Like, how quickly am I looking for a response in each of those situations? And I think that helps people know better how to manage those interruptions. I'm really curious when you were talking about the emails from Kim's example of say 80%, we can recognize the pattern. And then there's that 20% that might have some more complexity. The big board story that you were sharing as the tool, like Was that part of the intention around the big board was to sort of share those learnings so that, okay, if I get this type of email, I can go to this board and see this type of response versus the more complex. I'm just curious, like how you actually address some of that pattern matching. Yeah. So that was purely a collaboration communication tool. So our product team was 150 people and there were 15 people working on different parts of the product. And the big board, the goal specifically was to help people understand what those teams were doing and how that work might impact other teams Mm. who are also working either in a similar area or on an unrelated thing that might have some connection to what they were doing. So it's more informational. Kim, I'm curious with, you know, as you hear what Jason was sharing, given your experience and maybe things have changed since you ran the AdSense team, but How did you differentiate between sort of, here's an an email, we've seen this a million times versus a more complex response? Do you have any tips to share from that sort of process? Well, I think if we go back to that McKinsey article that you mentioned, I think one of the issues with the McKinsey article is that it takes the perspective of the manager and it's like, don't allow other people to waste your time, big, important manager. And I think one of the most important things that I want to leave people with is if you're the manager, before you worry about your own time, you should be worried about your team's time. I mean, one of the most frustrating things that I experienced as an employee is sitting outside the boss's office waiting for just, and then the whole rest of my, it like cascaded the whole rest of my day. Now I'm being inconsiderate to my direct reports because my boss is making me wait for them. I mean, the amount of time I spent at different companies waiting for meetings that were on schedule that were running over schedule was huge. I I can remember waiting for these EMG meetings at Google, the executive management group meetings. And so you're waiting for, there would be upwards of 30 or 40 senior people at Google waiting often for two hours because they weren't doing a good job staying on schedule. So I think one of the most important things you can do as a leader is to stay on schedule. Don't waste your team. Don't make people sit around waiting for you. I mean, one of the things that that I really appreciate about a boss is that they never waste a minute of my time. I'm never sitting around waiting for them. And then, so that's, I guess, the first thing when I talk about wasting your team's time. Now, part of the reason why I think that McKinsey article is important is that If you understand how your ability to be productive gets chopped up by constant interruptions, then you're more likely to be, to understand that the same thing is true for all the people who work for you. I think if we, to, now that did not answer your question, Amy, I will confess, but I just wanted to share what I was thinking. No, that's, so so I think just to be clear, step one, don't waste your team's time and look really having the empathy to take it from the perspective of your team. Yeah. Yes. 
And so I think if you think about the benefit of large chunks of uninterrupted time to do creative work, the issue is that no matter what you're doing, no matter what your role is as an individual contributor, whether it's pulling weeds or answering support emails, the kinds of things where you need large chunks of uninterrupted time are more sort of big think moments. Like, so if my job is to pull weeds, I want to sort of spend some amount of time when I'm outdoors figuring out a better way to manage this weed pulling process, right? And that's going to require some uninterrupted time. Whereas if I'm just pulling the weeds or just answering routine emails, it's okay if I get interrupted. So it's okay to interrupt my email time, but it's not okay to interrupt my think time, in other words. And so I think that was what was going through my mind there. And it's really, it's interesting when I block time to write, I really shut down everything. In fact, I always have all my notifications off on my phone. The only way to interrupt me is to make a phone call, to call my cell phone. I will not hit my texts, don't ding, none of that stuff. And it's because when I write, I cannot afford to be interrupted because I'll be thinking, 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 and then I'll be just on the cusp of an idea. And if my phone beeps, it's gone. And I've wasted that the previous 30 minutes. There's a a funny thing I read recently about a writer who, and not that every big thing thing is writing. There's a lot of different ways to have big think times that require sort of solitary work. But she was just on the verge of writing the. she had been struggling with a sentence and she had spent 45 minutes getting it right. And then the doorbell rang and she stood up to answer the door and she went back and she like, it was all gone. So what would have taken her an additional two minutes now was going to take her 45 minutes to get back into it. And I think that that is important to understand whether. Can, can I share a personal story like yeah. that? For those of you playing along, I had thought about getting a a puppy and wrote a blog post about how I, instead of getting a puppy, I ended up getting a wearable ring to track my progress and keep me exercising. Well, I did end up getting a puppy. And Kim, the story you were sharing reminds me of uh, this easily distracted puppy who uh, I only have a few minutes to get them to go to the bathroom. And they're just about to go to the bathroom. And then all of a sudden, someone drives by or someone very interesting with a shopping bag walks by and they get distracted. And the moment is gone. Yes. And so uh, to me, as you were telling that story, I was thinking about that, like, we're all here, we're all ready. And then it's like one distraction. And, and then they got to the start sniffing the gone. ground all over yeah. again to find that <laughs> <Exactly>. perfect spot. <laughs> so I hope, at least for me, that really kind of brings it to mind of the value of, of think time. So just to get back to your implementation model, we talked about not wasting your team's time, the importance of blocking time to actually implement. Jason, do you have any other tips from your perspective on blocking time? Well, I think speaking to Kim's point about talking directly to managers for a moment, I think the one of the most important things that you can do is respect when your team blocks time to do work. It is where I was going with the conversation about like expectations and turnaround time for various like interruption mediums like email or phone calls or text messages is you want part of what that's doing is it's creating permission to ignore certain types of interruptions. And I think it's really important to establish norms around that, especially when the work that a team is doing is largely interrupt driven, like a sales team or a customer service team as examples of that, right? Like it is sort of like an interrupt driven type of work where literally every communication from a client could be an interruption. And the question is, how do you stop that from overwhelming you and making you completely unable to do that? And then you add on top of that, a manager as well-intentioned as it might be, who's like, oh, you know, I just had this great idea for how we could make this thing so much better. And do you have a few minutes to talk about it? I think you need to be really careful about doing that, especially when the person is in the middle of their sort of think time. Just confessing for myself, like, on the one hand, it seems entirely logical to say like, oh, I'm having a big thought. So why don't I interrupt (laughs) your big thought time with my big thought, which is not the point. (laughs) 
My uh, big thought trumps your big thought. Yeah, exactly. I love that you brought that in, Jason. And I'm curious when you had that discussion with the sales ops team, like, do you distinguish between this is time to do sort of the interruptible tasks versus the sort of big thought tasks? Like, how do you make sure that you know that you're respecting their time? Right. As a team, we haven't quite gotten to that level yet. It's something that we've just built enough capacity on the team to start doing it. But we are having like very open conversations about how we actually manage that. And one of the things that you will often have to do, especially if someone has sort of interrupt driven or sort of a stream of work, is you're going to need to backfill them. You're actually going to need to help figure out who's going to take on that work for the period of time that they are sort of off the phones, if you will. That is probably the best thing that you can do if you have a team who's like very busy is to basically say, okay, we're going to specifically set aside some time. And not only are we going to set aside some time, we're going to find a way to backfill what's going on. Because one of the reasons why individual contributors avoid the big think time is they're like, oh, I'm going to go back to my inbox and there's going to be you know what I'm saying? There's just going to be eight more mm-hmm. hours of work waiting for me to do it. And that, I think, really discourages you from getting one of the biggest collaboration dividends, which is the fact that, Kim, I think this is what you were pointing to earlier. Like Managers have this perception that somehow their time is the most valuable. And if you're comparing to a single other person on your team, you might be able to make that argument. I'm not convinced that you can make it, but you might when you're comparing to a single other person on the team. But when you compare to your team collectively, your time is the least valuable. Yeah, uh, by far the least. And so focusing on that and making sure you're, you're mindful of that, I really think does help you start to think of maybe these examples I'm giving don't match your team. But if you take that step back and say, if I respect the fact that collectively my team's time is far more valuable than mine, what are the things that I could be doing to support them actually taking the time to think about how to improve whatever it is they're doing opens up a lot of possibilities. So a specific example of that is if I'm going to have a one-on-one with someone who works for me, it should be so valuable that one hour they spend with me saves them three or four or five hours, right? There Mm. needs to be a return on the investment of time in the one-on-one. I mean, it's not always like I would be really a super manager if I could actually, but that's the goal. Often didn't achieve that goal, but that's the spirit. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. With which I approach those meetings. It's like, it's in service of you. And if it's a waste of your time, then I am failing as a manager. That is so interesting. It kind of, it goes back, Jason, to our conversation about thought partners. Kim, this was one that Jason and I had in your absence and this idea of needing to be involved and listening to understand, asking the questions. But also, Jason, one of the things we talked about was thought partner is measured by the employee's sort of experience of it. What a thought partner is for me could be different from you or Brandy or, or Kim. And so I'm curious, Jason, when Kim says I need to provide three, four, or five times value as a manager, how does that land for you? What do you think are some tips or anything else to share on that? I remember you turned it back on me, but I keep showing up for my one-on-one. So clearly I'm getting some sort of ROI on that. Yeah, I think Kim's exactly right. I, I, Kim, I think that's like a really good goal is to say, I want there to be a multiple, right? Every minute that we spend, I want it to be worth save you more than a minute. (laughs) Three times, it seems like to your point is maybe an aggressive goal. But I do think that there, especially if you're in a distributed team or largely remote, that time is also quite valuable for the sort of relationship building part of things. And, And I do believe that part of building a good manager, team member relationship is consistently providing value in your one on one interaction. So just calling that, that these aren't, it's not an either or. I think there's a tendency to try to like over optimize things when you hear a goal like, I want to return 3x the value. We don't want you to over optimize and turn that into like, yeah, put a little squiggle before that three or four X. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah approximately. I should, our collaboration should save you more time than it costs you. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So just to get back to the implement piece of the get shit done wheel, we've talked about the importance of not wasting time. We jumped ahead a little bit. We talked about the importance of blocking time. 
We're now talking about this idea of keeping the dirt under your fingernails. This was step two in how to implement your decision. And just talking a little bit about this idea of being a thought partner so that you can actually really know what is important to your team member, that the meetings are valuable. But Kim, what else do you mean about keeping the dirt under your fingernails? Why did you talk about dirt? Are you going back to a lot of gardening metaphors? Uh, as well, well. I, You're about one the of weeds. the things that I love to do is to weed. <laughs> I, yeah, I could, I could spend a lot of time outside in the yard, just sort of looking at what's plant growing and pulling up the weeds and love casting it. out California native wildflowers. So anyway, it's a a side project. Can I just pause on that though? Don't you feel like that those kinds of side projects make you able to be more present at work? Sometimes, sometimes I just skip my work. I remember one of my <laughs> guiltiest pleasures was skipping a whole day of work when I was working at Apple and pulling weeds and thinking, I can't believe that I'm out here pulling weeds and just not going into work today. But it was Ooh, what true it was confessions. A little, uh, yes, so true confessions. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do think that it's kind of a, in some ways, pulling weeds or picking shells, which is what I was doing on vacation. So it's a form of meditation, snorkeling, like going out and reconnecting with nature, I think helps me be more present with, with the other kinds of work that I do. So yes, it's a productive hobby in its own way. But what I really meant by keep the dirt under your fingernails, I, I talk about going spelunking as a manager. And this is the notion of getting three or four levels in the details on things. I think one mistake that a lot of managers make is they feel like they have to kind of stay above it all. And that is a big mistake. You want to make sure that you get into the details because it's a way of honoring the details. And it's also a way of making sure you really understand what work your team is doing. So that's what I mean by keep the dirt under mm -hmm. your fingernail. And to me, it sounds like, and we've talked about the spelunking on some other episodes, but in a way it really does help you understand, is this a solitary task? Is this a collaborative task? To your point about the emails from the AdSense team to really know the patterns that they were seeing, Jason, it sounds like you also are a fan of going into the details. Anything more to add before we move on to the fourth piece on the dirt, the fingernails, the spelunking? the gardening, the weeds. Uh, just to tie the pieces together, to be an effective thought partner, you need to have a good idea of what the details of the work are, right? Like it's very hard to help someone sort through their own thinking if you don't really know what's going on. The other thing is if I'm slightly more generous to managers than, than them hovering, I'm imagining them hovering on a sort of futuristic spacecraft, they're hovering above yeah. it. Like the other instinct that I think leads people to do that is like, oh, I'm empowering my team by staying out of the details. I, I'm like giving my team, you know, space by staying out of the details. But as soon as something goes wrong, you are now forcing your team members to pay a tax because they have to catch you up on all of the things that are yeah. happening mm -hmm. in order for you to be helpful. So that, that for both instincts, leave, create the same effect. So even if you think it's coming from a, a positive place of support, there's a real danger that you're going to make yourself less effective and therefore put yourself in the position of not being able to get the most paying more collaboration tax for less benefit. Do you have a tip, uh, just speaking as your direct report, I send you notes on Slack, emails, we have our video one-on-ones. How can I, as an example for you, or just it writ large, how can a direct report more accurately and more succinctly get their manager up to speed on the details. You know, I just think it's a little bit help me help you, but do you have any recommendations for the individual contributors that are listening of what's an effective way to, to sort of bring your, your boss along so that they're not surprised without maybe inundating them with too many details? I mean, I think that really depends on the person. One of the things that you and I do quite frequently that I think works well is that when we're talking about something very concrete or specific, like work we're doing for a client, you'll often share with me a proposal that says, here's what I'm proposing that we do with this client. And then I'll take some time to read that asynchronously. And we'll either at the end of that say, hey, let's have a quick conversation or like, this looks fine. I'm going to leave a couple of comments in here 
about what I like or what I think could be a little bit better, but otherwise you're good to go. I think it's the same discipline that we've talked about other in other situations, which is like, know what needs to be synchronous and know what can be asynchronous when you're communicating. And I think bosses being honest with themselves about it's not just from your perspective, like <laughs> maybe you need to get a little bit more disciplined about reading the stuff that your team members send you. If that's really what's going to help them get the most out of their time, for example, just because you say like, Oh, it's a little hard for me to interpret this just by reading. It doesn't mean like that might be a skill that you need to work on. So see it, look at it from both sides. I think also one of the classes that I taught at Google was called email haiku. And I just bumped into someone who said, I still teach that email haiku class. And this actually goes back to clarify. But very often when you need to explain things to people, you want to try to explain it in the sort of shortest possible way and really spend some time thinking about what are all the details that my boss does not need to know and what are the one or two things that my boss really needs to know? And this is why this is a loop. Like part of the way that we make sure that we have time to implement, I almost said execute, to implement is to make sure that we're doing a good job in the clarify step. And there are times when I have spent 45 minutes or an hour crafting a two-line email and it started out being a six paragraph email and I spent the time to cut it down to a one or two line email. And, and that always feels like a waste of time, but that is time really well spent. I'm always so proud when I delete most of my emails. I do the same thing. Like I'll, ha I'll write very long emails and then wind up deleting most of what I've written after I actually get to the point of understanding what is essential. And I actually feel like that is a perfect segue to the fighting meeting proliferation because it's the exact same mindset that you need to bring yeah. to meetings <laughs> that we're talking about bringing to the content of your emails. Yeah, great segue. And again, I love, Kim, that you talked about this is a loop and we're repeating things because it's really interesting, the relationship between clarifying and implementing and that we're constantly needing to get more clear. And, and it, it, it is really a, a founding principle of radical candor is, is clarity. So you did write in radical candor, by now, the get shit done wheel may be starting to feel like the meetings from hell wheel. If you're not careful, meeting proliferation can indeed bring to a grinding halt your ability to implement both as an individual and as a team. Being ruthless about ensuring your team has time to implement is one of the most important things you can do as a boss. So being ruthless about the number of words in your email and about the number of meetings you're having in your schedule. So Kim, tell us more about the grinding to a halt and what you can do to beat meeting proliferation. I think that meetings are like barnacles on a ship. And if you don't, if you don't scrape them all away every so often, they just grow. And people sort of feel bad about saying, no, I'm not coming to this meeting. So that is why I think you almost want to sunset all meetings. Declare meeting bankruptcy. Yeah. And, or it's like zero cost, <laughs> you know, you want to take every once in a while, you almost want to take all the meetings off your calendar and then put back the only the ones that are most necessary. It always feels a little bit mean to say, no, I'm not going to come to this. I remember uh, there were several times in my career where someone has said, this meeting is a waste of time. I will not come to it. And, and it was usually a meeting that I would organize. So I was like, oh, it felt like a gut punch. But that is really important feedback that you're getting. And you need to be open to that feedback from people. It, I loved our all hands meeting on the AdSense team. And I was so sad that people wanted to have it once a month and not once a week. But it, it like, was your roller coaster ride, Kim, what some people <laughs> wanted to ride roller coasters. You yeah, like that meeting. Exactly. Yeah, I like that meeting. But it got to a point where it had become repetitive and redundant. And I was learning a lot from it. But 200 people were there sitting there like, oh, I already know all this junk. And so it's really important that you're willing to, in fact, Jared Smith, who co-founded Qualtrics and who worked at both Juice and Google with me, he would come in and he would 
every morning and look at his calendar and discipline himself. There is one meeting on my calendar every day, at least one that I can cancel. And so I think it's really important to be ruthless about canceling. Anytime you're just going to a meeting to be polite, you are not being polite. You are wasting your own time and probably the time of other people. Yeah. I think, again, just for emphasis, we're, we want to make sure that managers are aware that they should be encouraging their teams to be ruthless as well. This is not just like, manager, you be ruthless with the meetings. Yeah. No, like you... <laughs> Ask people to be ruthless with you. Yeah, exactly. Ruthless may be another one of those violent words. Potentially. I think just be clear. Like the thing you really want is for people to be clear. And one of the things that that does, if you're expecting that, if that's a norm, is it forces you to describe the meetings that you're having, the purpose of them, and who needs to attend. (laughs) And so that clarification, based on people's clear feedback about how well that meeting is serving their needs or not, is incredibly valuable. And then if you combine that with, Kim, as you said, with blocking time for your own productive work, now you've got a recipe that helps to prevent long-term meeting proliferation to the point where people are scheduled to do a bunch of stuff every day that doesn't actually help anything happen. And that feels like being caught in traffic. For a lot of people who don't know exactly what's happening or maybe haven't built that sort of muscle of a haven't learned to feel frustrated by it, it's even worse because it feels like you're being very productive because you're doing so many things. Then it's shocking in three or six months when you're like doing your look back to say like, well, how did the last six months go? And you're like, did I actually get anything done? I I think the other thing is anytime you're sitting in a meeting feeling stressed out because like your Mm to-do list is growing, all your to-do list is you're going to have to do it after quote unquote after work. That means you have too many meetings. You need to do your work during the work day. And very often I find what happens is I would be scheduled back to back to back to back in meetings and I would get more and more and more stressed all day long because in every meeting it was clear that I had to do some work and all of that work was going to get done after dinner. And that was a problem. Great. I love that metric. Oh, but the no, other I'm- thing to fight meeting proliferation is to make sure that if you attend a meeting, you will be assigned at least one action item. (laughs) That tends to cut down. Sometimes meeting, part of the problem with meetings is that people want to show up at the meeting because they get FaceTime because there's a promotion obsession. And then you have this peanut gallery of time wasters in a meeting. And you want to make sure that doesn't happen. Hmm. I feel like we need another conversation to have Kim vent some of her frustration. I feel like some of these meetings she still haven't done. If I wake up in my calendar, like I don't like to have an agenda in my human relations. And I also like to have my calendar be kind of agendaless. <laughs> it's really <laughs> important to me. Well, on that note, it's now it's time for our Radical Candor checklist. Tips you can use to start putting Radical Candor into practice right away. Tip number one, do not waste your team's time. Allow space for people to get work done by limiting low-value interactions and interruptions while also making yourself available to offer coaching and guidance as needed. In other words, don't interrupt people when they're having their think time and don't expect people to respond in two seconds to your slacks and emails and texts. Tip number two, keep the dirt under your fingernails. Whether or not you love gardening as much as Kim does, the important thing here is to be a thought partner who is right there alongside your employees. You're listening, you're advising, and sometimes like Kim, you're actually answering some of those emails, doing the work, coaching, rather than someone who is like in a spacecraft, to quote Jason, just hovering above your team members thinking you're above it all and don't need to know the details. Tip number three, block time to implement. Put implementation time on your calendar and treat it as you would any other important meeting or task. Don't allow people to appropriate your implementation time for something they think is more important and do the exact same thing for your team members. Tip number four, fight 
meeting proliferation or stand up to meeting proliferation. Everybody hates the meeting that could have been an email. Before you schedule a meeting, ask yourself if it's really necessary. And if it is, only include the people who are critical or allow people who feel they're not critical to skip the meeting. Perhaps most important, don't schedule a meeting over someone's implementation time, someone else's think time. Well, for more tips, you can go to RadicalCandor.com slash resources and download our learning guides for practicing Radical Candor. You can learn more about the implementation process we just discussed in chapters four and eight of Radical Candor. Show notes, head over to RadicalCandor.com slash podcast. If you like what you hear, go ahead, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Feel free to provide feedback to podcast at RadicalCandor.com. And Kim, there's another book. There's another book. It is called Just Work, How to Root Out Bias, Prejudice, and Bullying to Create a Kick-Ass Culture of Inclusivity, available everywhere books are sold. Finally, I know you're wondering, where can I find some Radical Candor swag? RadicalCandor.com. There's a link. It says shop. Coffee mugs, sweatshirts, stickers. Maybe we should put some gardening tools on there. Maybe we should spaceships. We've got a lot of product possibilities ahead. Bye for now. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com. Thank you.